we go from believing in this life as well as the next to concentrating on this life rather than the next, ignoring the next, forgetting the next, maybe then even disbelieving in the next. We forget about Jesus' warning to his disciples in verse 40, you also must be ready because the Son of Man will come at an hour when you do not expect him. And several times in Luke's Gospel, Jesus tells his disciples that he's departing them, he's going to leave them. He's going to go to Jerusalem, be betrayed, put on trial and crucified. But, but in this passage that we're looking at today, he's getting us to look further ahead, not to his departure, but to his return. Because our temptation is the same temptation as Jesus' disciples, right? We can think that this life is all there is. And so we concentrate on this life. We put our hopes on this life and make all our plans and ambitions about this life. And we can forget that Jesus one day will return. So as we look at this pretty intense passage, we're going to see three things. So three questions, when, the how, and the why. Uh, when will Jesus return? How do we live until he returns? And, and why do we live that way? If you were here last week, you might remember Jesus saying this to his disciples. Do not be afraid, little flock, for your father has been pleased to give you the kingdom. Sell your possessions and, and give to the poor. Provide purses for yourselves that will not wear out a treasure in heaven that will never fail. Jesus is talking about storing up treasures in heaven. And you can imagine his disciples asking that question, when is heaven going to happen? When is this coming? When is this all going to happen? And it's like Jesus anticipates their question because this exactly is what he teaches next. He gives this series of little parables about the master-servant relationship. A relationship, a dynamic that would be very common in the ancient world. They were very used to it. The master has gone away to a wedding banquet. It must be a really good wedding banquet because he's back very, very late. In fact, they don't know when he's going to come back. It could be 2 o'clock in the morning. It could be at 6 a.m. It could be while everybody is still asleep. In other words, they're unprepared. They haven't expected him to be gone for so long. And so there's the potential that they could be caught unawares. And so Jesus summarizes his point in verse 40. You must also be ready because the Son of Man will come at an hour when you do not expect him. That little phrase, that expression, the Son of Man, comes from the book of Daniel. And when Jesus uses it, it's an incredibly loaded expression. The book of Daniel was written over 500 years before Jesus first stepped into history. And this expression, the Son of Man, is about this mysterious figure whom God will send to save his people, not just that, but to return and bring an end to all of history. And he will sit on a throne, he will rule a kingdom that will last forever. Now, if you're here and you're not yet a Christian, the Bible talks about how one day God is going to bring an end to it all. There is going to be a decisive end point to all of history where all that we see and know will be finished. And there's a trajectory in the Bible that begins right from the very beginning. When God created humanity, he created us to live in his presence. In the Garden of Eden, everything was perfect. We lived in the presence of God. And there was no sickness, no disease, no broken relationships, no, no violence or conflict, no death. But when Adam and Eve decided to live without God, we lost the presence of God. And maybe some of you ask, well, hang on, why are we getting punished for their mistake? But the thing is, the, the Bible says we are exactly the same as Adam and Eve. We would do exactly the same thing. Our inclination is always like them to push God to the sidelines of our lives. We want to be our own rulers. We do exactly the same thing. When we lost the presence of God, everything in this world became broken. There was violence and oppression, illness and sickness and disease, decay and death. But the story of the Bible is how God promises to save and restore a people. He makes promises to a guy called Abraham that his, he would have descendants, his descendants would be a great nation, and, and they become the Israelites. And to be honest, they have a very mixed record. They become a failed nation because they fail to obey and love God properly. And so over and over again in the Bible, in the Old Testament, God makes these incredible promises about how he's going to heal his people. He's going to restore them and give them a proper relationship with them again. And we're, we're given these glimpses of incredible peace. So, for instance, in the book of Isaiah, the, the wolf will live with the lamb, the leopard will lie down with the goat, the infant will play near the cobra's den, and the, and the young child will put its hand in the viper's nest. They will neither harm nor destroy on all my holy mountain. For the earth will be filled with the knowledge of the Lord as the waters cover the sea. In other words, 
God's going to heal all the brokenness. He's going to make all things new. We're, we're going to be able to live in God's presence. And all that's broken about this world will be healed and restored. And it's all going to be done through this mysterious figure who will one day return as ruler and judge. And when Jesus steps into history, he says, that's me. All those promises are fulfilled in me. I'm that figure. I'm the one who's come to save and I'm going to return as judge and I'm going to rule over all things. Now, the doctrine of the second coming of Jesus is a critical part of Christianity. I mean, we just declared it before when we recited that creed, and it's spoken about over 300 times in the New Testament. It's a really key part. But for many modern people, the belief that one day God is going to return and bring an end to the world is something that is simply too hard to believe. You know, it's archaic, it's old-fashioned, it's superstitious and supernatural. It doesn't make sense. We're beyond that now, aren't we? Uh, this attitude is depicted in um, Samuel Beckett's famous play, Waiting for Goddess. Um, in this play, two people, Vladimir and Estragon, meet and they talk as they wait for this figure called Goddard. They meet every day in this barren wasteland and, and Goddard doesn't turn up. And they talk and they meet and they often forget what they've met for and yet still Goddard doesn't turn up. And the play ends with them still waiting but Goddard hasn't turned up. And there are the, those closing words, let's go, and they stay. They're still waiting, they don't stop waiting and yet Goddard ever shows. And in the play, Beckett is saying, it's pointless waiting for a God who doesn't show up. You know, where is he? He's been talking about it, he hasn't come. It's pointless waiting for him. Therefore, don't create meaning in life around this God. You've got to create meaning in life yourself. You've got to find meaning and purpose in life yourself. Don't think God will give it to you. Now, if you don't think that there is a God in history and who will one day bring it to an end, then, then we do try to get meaning and purpose in life somehow, don't we? Sociologists list all the ways that there is at least two. Uh, you can get meaning and purpose in life out of materialism. You know, accumulation, and we're very good at doing that. Make your life, the good life, as comfortable as possible. Get lots of things. In fact, life can become a little bit like a race. You're competing against the people around you to get the most. And the winner is the one who has the most until the end. And they're nothing but a wisp of smoke in the crematorium chimney. There's materialism or there is hedonism. You, you live for pleasure, experiences. And sure, we might order life, our, our family relationships, our work, everything around getting particular experiences, doing what we want in life. And it might even be really good things, trying to achieve big things, make a difference in the world around us. But really, all these things are about making us. Now, it's easy to spot these sort of substitutes in the world around us, but what about our, ourselves? Let me briefly just talk to two audiences here for a moment. Maybe you're here today and you're not yet a Christian, you're exploring Christianity. Can you see in the Christian message the hope that is being offered to you? You were made for a purpose. You were made to know God. And all the frustrations, all the difficult things that you experience in life are there in part in God's kindness to show you that this world and this life is not all there is. This life and this world and all it offers you is too small for a creature that's been made in the image of God. This world and all it offers you is not big enough for you. Of course, there are others here. We believe in Jesus, but you know, sometimes the reality of Jesus' return hasn't quite sunk into our hearts. We don't live in response to it. Maybe if you're anything like me, um, you go through life and, and basically what you're planning and looking forward to are uh, particular experiences or achievements. You know, you want to make yourself happy. You do things in order to further your happiness. There are things in life that you don't look forward to, that you try to avoid. There are things in life that you are looking forward to. Ticking off the boxes, you know, those particular relational or family or work or career goals, achieving something. And in the process, like, kind of revolves around me, revolves around you. You kind of forget that there is a God who is one day going to return and end all things. And whilst, you know, I'm a Christian, you might be a Christian, when it comes to future expectations, basically a functional atheist. I'm no different to that guy, Simon, before. I expect to wake up in my bed tomorrow morning. Do you see the point that Jesus is making? There is the certainty of his return, but then the uncertainty about when it will happen. So don't think your life will go the course you expect it to go, that your life revolves around you, it revolves around God and on his imminent return. Now, if there is certainty about Jesus' return, how do we live until it happens? So Jesus says two things. First of all, be ready. And maybe as that passage was read earlier, you saw how many times Jesus mentions to be ready. Verse 35, be dressed ready for service and keep your lamps burning. 
Verse 38, it will be good for those servants whose master finds them ready. Verse 40, you also must be ready. He's drumming it in. In this first parable, we get this picture of the master-servant relationship. And the master has gone away, gone to a fantastic wedding banquet. He's going to be back late, who knows when, a couple of days maybe. And he's put a, a servant in charge to manage his household. And this servant is supposed to, 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 to manage all the other servants and to manage all the master's possessions. And the master says, hey, when I get back, I better find you doing what you're supposed to be doing. But who knows how long he's going to be. Many years ago, um, a friend scheduled with me that he was going to come around to my place for dinner and then we we're going to go out and, and do the things. And I scheduled it and then forgot about it completely. One morning the alarm went off and I kept pushing snooze, 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 kind of like that. Um, snooze. And then until I hear a knock on the door. And I remember, oh, I forgot. And so I, what do I do? Well, I immediately think, well, if I don't answer the door, it's just going to go away. And it'll all be fine. And no one will ever know. But he kept knocking and, and kept knocking and kept knocking and I couldn't ignore it. And so, you know, pyjamas, no shower, bed head. I open the door and there he is smiling at me saying, you forgot, didn't you? The Apostle Paul wrote to the Thessalonians about the day of the Lord. About times and dates we do not need to write to you, for you know very well that the day of the Lord will come like a thief in the night. While people are saying peace and safety, destruction will come upon them suddenly, as labour pains on a pregnant woman, and they will not escape. But you are not in darkness, so that this day should surprise you like a thief. You are all children of the light and children of the day. We do not belong to the night or to the darkness. So then, let us not be like others who are asleep, but let us be awake. Do you see what... Paul is saying. Ignorance of Jesus' return will lead to surprise when he returns. And Paul describes these people who are ignorant as though they are asleep. They seem to be people, yes, who could be busily involved with all the things going on in the world, busy in their careers, busy raising a family, busy doing things. They could be very successful, very active people in the way the world describes that. But Paul describes them as, spiritually speaking, asleep. And there's that chilling prognosis in verse 3, while people are saying peace and safety, destruction will come upon them suddenly, has labour pains on a pregnant woman, and they will not escape. Look, we don't know when that day will happen. Jesus has been telling us it's a certainty that will come, but uncertain about when. Indeed, it may very well be that we go to be with him. We die before he comes to us. And who knows the hour of our own death? Uh, just during this week, I was meeting with a friend who's got terminal cancer. And his doctors have given him a timeline, and it's not easy news. But at least he knows. He knows that it's coming. A lot of us just live in denial. We ignore the facts that that day is coming. We don't prepare ourselves. He, he, he at least knows. Paul says, let us not be like others who are asleep, but let us be awake and sober. And so if God somehow were to reveal to you that this year, this year was to be your last year, how would that knowledge transform, change you? How would it shape the way you relate to people, the way you, you speak to people around you? How would it shape a sense of urgency? resolve to share the gospel with those loved ones around you who do not yet to know Jesus? Would it shape you? Would it motivate you to seek peace in your life with people who you're out of relationship with? Would it encourage you to put aside those things that you worry about a lot, that you're focused on right now, but in the span of 10,000 years? It's so trivial. How would your life be changed? Jesus says be ready, but then secondly be faithful. Uh, verse 42, who then is the faithful and wise manager whom the master puts in charge of his servants? to give them their food allowance at the proper time. It will be good for that servant whom the master finds doing so when he returns. You know, when a master leaves, he normally puts the servant in charge of his possessions, of the household, to manage other servants, to be a steward. But when the master returns, will he find that servant being faithful? Remember, these possessions belong to the master, not to the servant. Some of you might have read The Lord of the Rings, uh, watched the movie, you know that one of the characters is a man named Denethor, the steward of Gondor. And it was the steward's job to take care of the king kingdom while the king was away. Um, we know in the story that the steward could not sit on the throne. He had to sit on the chair of the steward. Now in this story, um, the steward ends up being one of the bad guys because the king has been gone for many generations, and when the promised king turns up, 
a guy called Aragon, Denethor doesn't want him to return. He doesn't want there to be a king because the steward wants to be the king. The steward wants to be the king in charge of all the kingdom's possessions. A man named Charles Wesley once said, no character more exactly agrees with the present state of man than that of being a steward. In other words, there is nothing that sort of represents us or our task on earth better than being a steward, taking care of what God has given us. We're all like stewards in Jesus' story. We've been given particular gifts, possessions, opportunities for us to use for our master's causes. And one day the master is going to return. Every one of us is living off gifts that God has given each of us. Our talents and opportunities, nothing is our own. If you think you're more intelligent, or more talented than others, that's what God has given you. If you think you're better looking, more hard working, that as well is from God. Everything you have, your health, the longevity that you are enjoying, your talents, your connection, your wealth, your finances, everything is given to you. It's on loan just for a little while. But the thing is, we can often be like Denethor, the steward of Gondor. We don't want the return of the king. We don't want to be stewards. We want to be kings and queens ourselves. We want to keep hold of these possessions, they're ours, to be used for our purposes, our agenda, rather than that of the king. So if that's how we're supposed to live until Jesus' return, why then do we live this way? Jesus gives two motivations. First of all, the negative motivation. Verse 46, but suppose the servant says to himself, my master has taken a long time in coming, but then he begins to beat the other servants, both men and women and to eat and drink and get drunk, the master of that servant will come on that day when he does not expect him, at an hour that he is not aware of. He will cut him to pieces and assign him a place with the unbelievers. Now, immediately you might look at those words, he cut him to pieces, and you think, ah, oh, he's spiteful, angry. Why do we have to have the judging God, a punishing God? Why can't we just have a loving God? But you also know, if you love someone, that sometimes you'll be angry with that person. Like if that person does something to harm other people or harm themselves, your love for that person will prompt anger, right? Becky Pippett puts it like this. Think of how we feel when we see someone we love ravaged by unwise actions or relationships. Do we respond with benign tolerance as we might towards strangers? Far from it. Anger isn't the opposite of love, hate is. And the final form of hate is indifference. God's wrath is not a cranky explosion, but his settled opposition to the cancer which is eating out the insides of the human race he loves with his whole being. When God sees people acting in a destructive way or, or not using what we've been given for his purposes, when we're ruining his creation, when we're harming his creatures, people around us, God's not indifference. His love will prompt anger. Now look, if you don't believe that God will one day end his that Jesus will one day return, then what stays your hand? What restrains you from seeking revenge on people who hurt you? What stops you from just adding to the cycle of retaliation and retribution and bitterness? But if you believe in a God who sees all things and knows all things and who will return one day, then believing in that God, far from escalating anger and revenge and retribution when people harm you, will actually hold you back. You won't add to the cycle of bitterness and spite and hatred. It'll in fact help you to forgive because you know that one day God's going to return and make all things right. He will bring justice. You and I are not capable of judging the world. We want to be judges, but we're flawed and we're normally guilty ourselves. But God is going to return and make all things right. That's what enabled the early Christians, for instance, when they were persecuted, to pray for the forgiveness of their persecutors. That's a negative motivation. What about the positive one? Well, it's there in verse 37 and it's staggering. It will be good for those servants whose master finds them watching when he comes. I tell you the truth, he will dress himself to serve. He will have them recline at the table and will come and wait on them. Those who are found ready and faithful, the master himself will dress to serve and he will serve them. You know, often the Bible describes heaven like a banquet and you know, all of a sudden you're sitting up because we're Hong Kong people and we love a banquet. Right? All you can eat, just lobster, prawns, everything. But this is a heavenly banquet. And Jesus is there. He's hosting. And not only is he hosting, he is serving. And do you remember on another occasion when Jesus was dressed to serve on the night before he died? John 13, just before supper with his friends, he took off his outer robe, wrapped a towel around his waist, picked up a basin of water and went round to each of his disciples and washed their feet. But here is a heavenly banquet. For all those who've been found ready and faithful, and Jesus will focus all the immensity on his, of his power on serving you. Think of who he is, the one who has 
put the stars into place, the one for whom the universe was created. Think of his power, what he can focus as a means to serving you, to gladden your hearts, to heal and restore and bring consolation, all for those who have been found ready when he returns. A few years ago, I remember reading a blog. It was a blog by a palliative care nurse. You know, palliative care nurses care for people who are dying. And, you know, in the first three months of this blog, apparently there were a million hits. After a year, there were three million. People were interested in what she had to say. And the blog turned into a book, Five Regrets, she observed, of the dying. One, I wish I had the courage to live a life true to myself, not the life others expect of me. Two, I wish I hadn't worked so hard. Three, I wish I had the courage to express my feelings. Four, I wish I stayed in touch with my friends. Five, I wish I'd let myself be happier. Lamentable as those regrets are, I can think of a greater regret. You know, to get to the end of your life and to be ushered into the throne room of God and to be found face to face with Jesus and behold him in all his glory, his nail pierced hands and side, and to have cascading down upon you full recognition for the first time in your life, complete clarity of who he is and what he has done for you. And then to have that stunning realization that you've held back from him, everything that he has done for you, the son of God, everything that he has done and you, you held back because you were fixated on the things of this world, even though you knew the truth of what you had done. This life is just the first page of the eternity to come. So why wouldn't we give our all for the one who has given his all for us? Use what he has given us, rather than hoarding them, using them however long we've given him, he's given us, until we see him face to face. Do you pray with us? Lord God, we do uh, thank you just for this reminder, even if it's ever so brief, of the transience of our lives, that all these things that we work hard for, that we covet, that we desire, that we worry so much about in this life, are transient. They're here one moment, they're gone the next, they're a mist, they're a vapor, and they can't keep all the promises that they whisper in our ears. But Lord, help us to lift our eyes and to, to look forward to Jesus' return, to look up to the heavens when we will be with him, and there fix the anchor of our hope knowing that what Jesus has in store for us is immeasurably, incalculably greater. So Lord, help us to be people who are ambitious, um, to desire what Christ is holding out for us, not to be content with sitting in a puddle of mud when there is a holiday. There is an immensity of eternity in your presence without brokenness or tears waiting. In the meantime, Lord, until we see Jesus face to face, help us to be wise stewards, to use what he has given us, what you have given us for this brief time, joyfully, gladly, not holding back, not being miserly. Help us to be generous because you've been so immeasurably generous to us in your, your son Jesus. Spirit, would you guide us because we are quick to forget, quick to get enamored with things of this world. Help us to behold Jesus in all his glory, seek to come into his presence. And we ask these things in your name.